Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to today's event, uh, Creating Our Paths Up Close and Personal with Elected Leaders. Uh, this particular event is also part of our Cause Leadership Institute a program that is a community leadership and advocacy training certificate program. All of the participants are professionals that have been nominated by elected officials, nonprofit board members, uh, as well as other executive leaders. And so we're really excited to be able to have this event today, uh, to be able to share it openly, um, as well as to, we're, we are also recording this event so that we'll be able to uh, host it on our website as well. So people have opportunities to hear some of these stories. Um, I want to also take a moment to thank our sponsors for this program. They include the Centene Foundation, Southern California Edison, Southern California Gas Company, and Walmart. In addition, we also have uh, sponsors who support our organization generally, uh, and they also help make all of this happen. This includes the JT Tai Foundation, Charlie Wu, Annenberg Foundation, East West Bank, Glassman Family Fund, Standing with, Stand with Asians, Unibail Rodamco Westfield, Southwest Airlines, and the Asian Pacific Community Fund. So we thank all of our sponsors for just uh, supporting our work and giving us opportunities like this one to hear the stories from uh, our leaders in the political elected spaces. Um, I also want to just let everybody know that in addition to recording this event, uh, we will also have Zoom Q&A feature available to any attendees who want to share any questions they may have. For the Cause Leadership Institute fellows who are also here today, uh, you will have an opportunity to raise your hand and ask your questions uh, as well. Uh, there's also transcript and English subtitles on the bottom right hand of your Zoom tool. I'd now like to invite Charlie Wu, the Cause Board Chair, to say a few words about Cause and our topic for today. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Nancy. Welcome, welcome to this very special session of the Cause Leadership Institute. And uh, just give you a little bit of background. COS was formed 28 years ago, 1993, with the mission to empower the Asian Pacific American community by encouraging community involvement in politics, voter education and registration efforts, leadership development, and uh, research and, and advocacy. And uh, in each of the area, we have programs and this cost leadership institute is one of several very well popular well-run popular leadership programs that cost has to offer and uh and it the reason we make this a special event and open to the public is because of the the the, the, the caliber of speakers that that we have not only will we think that the cross leadership institute fellows would benefit from it i think that you know, the community at large should really know the kind of program that we run so that they can see how we conduct this, uh, this leadership program and also hear from our leaders. Usually we, you know, we tell people to look up and admire and follow their leaders, but seldom do you get to know the leaders at a personal level to understand their journey, their background and what make them tick and where, how they chart their journey and how they look to the future. So this is one of those opportunities that we get our, one of the most important leaders in California and as well as in Asian American community to do that. And we like to congratulate Attorney General Rob Bonta being the first Filipino American to be appointed Attorney General. By the way, he's not the first Asian American Attorney General of California. For those of you wonder who the first Asian American Attorney General was it was our vice president Kamala Harris, and and that that goes to show the caliber of leaders that that position requires. And before Attorney General Bonta, I am personally very excited to be able to uh, reconnect with State Controller Betty Yi. The State Controller is the chief fiscal officer for the world's fifth largest economy. She is in charge of all the finance of the state of California. And, uh, and, and that's a good friend of ours that, you know, that every year she volunteered to, to meet and 
speak with the, the CLI group. And year in and year out, she has been the most popular speaker. Everybody want, to, want her back and they want to talk to her. And it is because she is, as actually she, she mentioned earlier, she would give you some real stuff. She's just not a dynamic leader that we look up to. She, you know, she is real. You can feel her sincerity, her drive, her in intellect, and we know how she thinks as you communicate, as you will see in the next half an hour. So, and that's the, you know, I, every time I listen to Betty, I heard it so many times, I learned something new about her, about politics and about life. So and I couldn't wait to hear again after, by the way, the last cost in-person event was feature, we featuring state control, Betty Yee. And right after that, we went on quarantine. So it's good to have her sort of kick off a program again, now that the lockdown is officially lifted. I'm sure that she would be happy to meet all of us again in the future. So with that, I'm gonna introduce, get back to Nancy so that she can moderate this discussion with Betty Yee. Thank you. Thanks so much, Charlie, and welcome, Controller Yi. It's great to have you here. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, and thank you, Charlie, for the kind introduction. And uh, I know even though we're not meeting in person, I do look forward to meeting the um, CLI fellows in person sometime soon. Yes, we're hoping to be able to do that soon, too. Um, I'm going to kick us off with a few questions just to get it started, and then I'll open it for the CLI purchase fellows and attendees to share questions, too. Um, but we just kind of thought we'd we'd get to know you a little bit better and also hear about what what was that moment that you realized that you wanted to become an elected leader? Uh, what was the the catalyst that made it that started your journey? Yeah, no, thank you, Nancy. And it's um I always think about this question because when um uh, you when Cause Pose poses it every year, uh, I just kind of marvel and almost kind of pinch myself that, you know, it's for so many reasons, I shouldn't even be in this position, you know, given my background, you know, growing up as a, a, the second oldest of six children to immigrant parents who ran a laundry and dry cleaning business in San Francisco. I mean, we grew up poor and um, it was uh, really um, being an advocate for my immigrant parents, non-English speaking uh, in so many ways, you know, dealing with vendors and helping out with the business. Uh, interaction with the customers, um, taking care of all of, of all the financial transactions for them. And um, it was really when I was 13 years old, I, I was an advocate for not only my parents, but the four Chinese American families in the neighborhood on the west side of San Francisco. Um, and uh, being an advocate for them because my younger sister was going to be part of the first class to be bused across the city as part of the uh, San Francisco Unified School District, um, a school desegregation program. And I was tasked by the families to attend a local school board town hall meeting, which was going to be at the school auditorium just two blocks away from my parents' business, and to provide a statement that uh, we didn't oppose the um, goals of the busing program, but because all of the families were small business owners, worked six or seven days a week, that, that if an emergency should arise with any of their children during the school day, that they'd have to take public transportation well over two hours to bring their child home and uh, none of the, the parents drove. And I remember making that statement at the age of 13 and uh, the busing program lasted for the better part of the next 30 plus years and, and everything was fine. Nothing happened to my siblings, my sister. Uh, but that moment really left an impression uh, with me that I was a voice for someone. And you know, when I think about that time uh, now and certainly my background as a daughter of immigrants and how, you know, such a common immigrant experience where so much of the time the children, you know, just, uh, you know, bear these responsibilities of uh, being advocates for their parents. And uh, so I would say that that was really, you know, kind of the, the formative experience. Uh, I never thought I would be an elected official, however, I knew I would be an advocate. And, um, you know, being uh, working around elected officials, um, I decided to put my hat in the ring when I saw uh, really others who were interested in running for uh, the, at that time, the Board of Equalization. And I just felt that I had the experience and that I knew more and decided that I would um, essentially throw my hat in the ring. And I knew enough um, and have enough support to be able to be successful. But you know, those early years, uh, and, and I just really do wanna emphasize this, 
I think all of us just have, have opportunities to be an advocate in one way uh, or another, whether it's, uh, it's with our families on issues, whether it's just standing up for someone or uh, calling out some sort of injustice. Um, but that can be very foundational in terms of uh, just looking at a path towards, uh, you know, becoming uh, a, a public official. No, thanks for sharing that moment. And then also just talking about just so many layers of engagement, of civic engagement um, from just kind of the earlier moment um, around the, the school busing and then also later to just throwing your hat in. Um, and I'm just curious uh, with all these different elements of your path, you know, what are the things that you actually learned from others and what are the things that came from your unique background? Yeah, yeah, well, thank you. You know, I think some of the times, um, and I know this to be true for myself, um, you know, being a daughter of immigrants, uh, there was a time when I was growing up that I was actually ashamed of that background. Um, I was um, unusual among my classmates and my peers, you know, growing up. Um, you know, my parents didn't have a regular job. They, you know, were in business. I couldn't be involved in school activities after school because I would go home and help my parents with the, with the, with the family business. And, um, and that, that just, um, I, I think I just felt like I was missing out on, you know, so much, you know, growing up, but looking back now, uh, those were such foundational elements in terms of understanding uh, certainly today, uh, what it takes to run a small business, all the elements of um, you know what what it means to uh, be successful and to be able to thrive. Uh, also, the early interaction with adults as a result of you know being advocates for my parents. I think uh, you know just putting myself in those situations where uh, I really didn't have a choice but to you know establish relationships with adults, whether they were customers or whether they were vendors or you know the 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 bank tellers up the street. Uh, you know, so that I think was was helpful as well. And then, um, you know, I think what, so that's my unique experience that I bring to this, but the other elemental um, aspects of this is, um, you know, it's just really coming to understand that, um, you know, government just has so much impact on our lives and uh, beginning to understand that, you know, when we interact with government, that we actually have a voice in the process. And, you know, that experience when I was 13 was the beginning of it, but it certainly wasn't the end of it. And there were many, many more times when, um, you know, I remember even going to city hall and protesting a, you know, kind of a business license fee that my parents had to pay. Um, certainly um, talking about, you know, just a, a lot of, um, you know, just financial burdens that my parents had to, you know, overcome um, just raising six children. So, I would say that um, you know just that advocacy continued and it took different forms but when we got to the kind of the bigger stage of actually working on you know broader issues beyond just those affecting my parents uh, i would say that those were definitely some very uh, foundational uh, informative elements uh, leading to my path were there were there like mentors and champions along the way that encouraged you to to keep going for it <laughs> you know it's interesting um the, the, the biggest mentors, although I don't think they really understood what it meant, uh, where I would end up, were my parents. I mean, I think because it, that I was, um, it was a necessity that I, you know, speak out for them. Um, but there really weren't mentors who looked like me, uh, who, you know, really could understand, you know, what was really driving me. Um, but the mentors whom I did encounter were, uh, you know, teachers that I had. Um, who really took an interest in uh, you know what I had to experience at home, um, and and then I grew up on the west side of San Francisco at a time where uh, many of the small business owners, when my parents had their laundry and dry cleaning business, uh, were you know European descendants. Um, as I said, there were only four Chinese American families, and and so everyone had kind of that immigrant background. And I went to school with a lot of the children of of uh, those small business owners, and so I felt like we were a community that just supported each other. And um, so I would say, you know, a lot of my mentors were um, uh, some of my parents' customers. I mean, you thought I had to bring home a good report card for my parents. I had to bring home a good report card for all of the customers as well. So it was, um, you know, kind of no pressure. But uh, uh, I would say it was a, just a very supportive community um, that just cared about, um, you know, all of the children in the community being successful. And, and as I grew older, you know, they really continued to be, um, you know, very present in my life, in my development. I love that that story of community, even if there it feels like it comes with a lot of pressure. <laughs> did. But I, it's true. I, you know, I know one of the things we mentioned is that you're also a first, the first Asian American woman um, to hold your position. And 
And I think there's a lot of conversations around things that have changed, but also the history of the Asian and Pacific Islander community. I'm just wondering in, in your time uh, in office, what are the things that you've seen change for APIs in the political space? Yeah, no, it's, I think a lot has changed and I'm actually very happy about it. Um, first of all, um, I, as you hear our Vice President Kamala Harris say a lot of the times, you know, she may have been the first, but she certainly is not going to be the last. And I've had so many people who I feel like have paved the way for me. I mean, certainly with respect to being an API in office, um, I look to people like, you know, John Chung and Judy Chu and, you know, so many others who came before me, Norm Mineta, um, you know, who just really, you know, created their own pathway, you know, into public service and into elective office that, um, again, really based on their passion to serve, but also, you know, bringing so much of themselves and their own background to the work that they do. Uh, so I'm happy to say that I think there are definitely more APIs, um, you know, in our state and throughout our state and across the country who are interested in serving in a public uh, capacity. And I think that's good news. Um, and I think the other thing that's changed is that for women, um, and I would say API women especially, um, that, um, you know, for, for disciplines like mine, where I'm the controller and deal with money, I have to say stereotypes help. You know, I mean, this whole thing about Asians being good with money, um, people have this faith in us. And, and, you know, I hate to admit that the stereotype is a true one, um, but it actually has been helpful because we're serious. And I remember when I got elected to the State Board of Equalization and it happened to be that four out of five members were API members. It was uh, uh, then controller John Chung, um, Board of Equalization member Judy Chu, Board of Equalization member Michelle Park Steele and myself. And I was waiting for someone to write the article, you know, Asians run for the Board of Equalization because they're good at math. And, uh, and finally, George Skelton with the LA Times wrote a column about why is this happening? And I remember he interviewed each of us and I said, look, you have to really understand what we come to these roles uh, with in terms of our experience, our history, our background. I said, my parents were immigrants. They had a laundry and dry cleaning business. And um, if you weren't darn good at math, you probably weren't gonna survive in your business. And so, uh, you know, that's the story I want you to write. Not the fact that, you know, when we're all some, you know, superstar, you know, model minority good at math, but that, you know, this was really driven by, you know, just so much about what our journey has been about. So I think there's been a lot more room for us to get, put those stories into um, a frame so that people understand where we come from, what our uh, shared histories are uh, within our communities and also with other uh, communities, particularly the immigrant story. And, um, and then being able to serve in a way where, you um, we bring our own experiences that start to inform us about how we can use our roles to really help with issues of uh, equity and justice. Sure, and I think it's important too to note just, uh, and, and I think what I'm hearing is just how we tell that story, yes. and that there is a truth to being good at math, but there's so much more, such a diversity, um, but also a very tangible, um, background that we have that makes it necessary a necessity for us to be able to do certain things and so um, that that's diverse based on every candidate and so I, I think the more I get to also have an opportunity uh, to meet more more leaders like you I can hear that difference in each of those stories um, and I think that's what we're really trying to do um, yes. I want to open it up to the fellows in our program. I know that one of the things that you've also um, been, been a big advocate for is leadership uh, development as well as mentorship. And so I want to invite the fellows to ask any questions they may have. You can raise your hand or you can also just unmute yourself if you have a question uh, for Controller Yi. I'll give folks a moment. Well, thank you so much. I just really loved hearing your story and and also your journey as a small child and even thinking tracing that narrative. Um, I'm I'm a small business owner myself and an educator, and I was one. And I have two small kids, and I was wondering what do you think about um, just raising young kids to grow up to be like civically engaged leaders um, throughout their lives? And I mean, so much of of after school now is like about enrichment, right? Especially if you could have made it to the middle class and like. I'm like, oh, maybe I should put my kids to work. Like, is that actually, <laughs> you know, um, what should we be doing? Or, yeah, I was wondering if you had some thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I do. I do. How old are your children? They are five and seven. So okay. So young. But there's, but with the whole pandemic, they definitely are going in and trying to like change our PowerPoint slides. I'm like, God. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, no. You know, it's it's interesting. I don't think there's any shortage of opportunities to, uh, you know, the, the, the I think the first um, element of really um, getting young people engaged is to start talking to them about things that are happening around them. Um, you know, to start developing that awareness about, you know, kind of their place and their, you know, kind of um, uh, position uh, among what's happening to them. And um, your children may be um, too young uh, for this particular aspect, but one of the things I've actually been heartened by with um, a lot of the recent rallies and and uh, visibility events around the stop API hate is just the um, multi generational aspect of you know who is out there raising visibility for our community, and uh, I think that's actually a very good development. You know, we haven't seen um, you know frankly you know from grandparents to grandchildren you know together you know just marching together, and uh, and helping to really um, begin that educational process about what this is all about, and so I think that's important to do. Um, they're probably going to pick it up somehow anyway, but just to directly engage them about what this means and why we're doing this, I think is um, you know really uh, helpful. I think the other aspect of it too is um, you know there is uh, particularly during this pandemic, um, I think there's a lot more opportunity to really have that more direct engagement. So. Um, and to you almost have a little bit more latitude in terms of the kinds of things you want to raise with them rather than them than they're being exposed to something and you're trying to kind of guess after the fact about what they already know or what they don't know and so uh, i would just say um, you know anytime that you can just um, have them think about uh, something that you feel like uh, gets them to uh, really understand more about what's happening around them is good and i'm not saying have them watch the news by any means but it is about you know hey what what, what why are why are people you know out there talking about this or um, you know what's happening in terms of you know the schools and uh, obviously schools an important environment for them but um, so I, I would say that uh, but that direct engagement is rare I mean I know when I grew up you know I didn't get any of that from my parents um, I pretty much had to pick it up myself um, so I do think it's like this really great you know kind of uh, golden opportunity right now that you have Great, thank you. Thank you for that. I see we have another question, so I'm going to go ahead and jump over. But thanks, Jen, for your question. Um, and Vaughn, do you want to go ahead and uh, turn on your camera and unmute yourself for your question? Uh, hello, Control. Betty. Hello. Uh, nice to see you again. You um, too. I, I saw you a couple of times at the um, uh, CSBA um, for School Board Association. So yes. we invite you to come and talk to our uh, Asian Pacific Islander. So my question to you is, uh, can you share any experience of your successful or and also maybe failure issue during your political journey? And how do you handle that? And what advice are you giving to our younger generation who want to follow your footsteps? Sure. No, it's a great question. Uh, I'm going to share an experience that was both the uh, success and um, I guess, uh, fail, uh, first of all, failure is not in my vocabulary. Um, <laughs> I think we all have setbacks, um, but I think um, when we put our heart and soul into what we do, uh, there's no such thing as failure in my mind. So when I decided to run for statewide office, uh, <clears throat> I for controller for the first time in 2014, I started my campaign probably about three years ahead of the actual election. and. I was considered the underdog. I was, um, uh, my opponent uh, included the Speaker of the Assembly, um, um, very powerful figure who had the ability to raise a lot of money. And um, I had been on the Board of Equalization representing a quarter of the state, but um, I will say every ism came out, um, you know, where uh, obviously, you know, being API um, and being a woman, I mean, just, all the stereotypes and not necessarily the flattering ones came out about um, you know what it meant to you know run for this seat that um, maybe I knew the subject matter but that I wasn't going to be able to raise the money I wasn't going to be able to you know um, be able to speak to you know to broad groups of audiences and um, so I was considered the underdog um, but what I um, did and and there were some many dark moments during that campaign because essentially um, I didn't raise the most money but I raised enough. Um, and there were a lot of people who shut their doors on me and basically said, we're supporting the speaker. We don't feel like you have a chance. Um, and I think what I would say in terms of the lessons learned from all of that is one, you just really have to have a good belief in yourself. 
and your own abilities. Um, and I just decided that I was going to have a different way of running for office, that I wasn't going to pay attention to my opponent. I just needed to do what I needed to do to be successful. And it actually worked because I knew that, um, one, I knew I, women always have to work harder. Um, APIs always have to work harder. Um, so that was just part of the territory in terms of being successful. Uh, but the second aspect of it is, um, you know, I already, I, I really um, put a lot of emphasis on my experience. I mean, in this case, experience matters. This was not about just popping into another office that I didn't know anything about. I was the most qualified person for this job. Um, and I think sometimes when you're put in a position of really doubting yourself, you stop believing in, in that, in your own abilities. And I would say that's the biggest lesson that I walked away from, uh, from this election, uh, learning and continuing to you know, kind of keep in mind was that I was the most qualified person <laughs> for this role. And so uh, one, believe in yourself. Two, um, know that when you're the underdog, we're always gonna work harder. And so that just, you know, we just elevate that uh, to the next level. And then three, um, you know, just really begin to um, take everything that Nancy was talking to me about, your narrative and be able to translate that into a way of connecting with the voters. You know, what's that one kernel that you can leave with the voters as you're speaking to them, as you're writing your statement for the run for office, that's just gonna really, you know, connect with them. And I have to say that, um, you know, growing up in a small business um, background with my family really resonated. And my um, background in public finance also really resonated because um, so many Californians just felt like those were really good uh, qualifications for the job. So um, so I would say the failure, uh, not a failure, the setback. Yeah, I mean, it got me to doubt myself, but it just got me to double up in terms of, you know, just working that much harder for something I really wanted. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. No, and I think, and it's so interesting just in telling our stories and our narratives I think it's also, there's been, because there's been a lot of change, one of the questions from uh, one of our participants, Jessica Chang, she's asking, what is easier for candidates now versus what is harder, especially being AAPI? Yeah. You know, I think what's easier for candidates now is that there are, there's a lot more support for candidates, um, and particularly for API candidates, um, a lot more training programs, a lot more um, kind of the campaign infrastructure that can help candidates be successful, uh, and knowing how to do that, and uh, in a, that really respects, you know, kind of our culture and our background. Um, and, and then obviously the um, ability to communicate in um, much broader ways through social media. But I will say this, social media is not a proxy or a substitute for in-person communication during campaigns. Uh, it's a way to get a message out, but you have to reinforce that, you know, by being in person and being present. Um, so, and, and it's not even a proxy for, you know, uh, fundraising. I think this is where I think um, candidates sometimes make the mistake that, um, you know, you just don't have to uh, be in front of people. And that, and I think that is a huge mistake to not, uh, to not do that. And then um, I think some of the things, some of the ways that it's been more difficult is, um, seems like we're having elections kind of year round. And so how do you really create that space to where your campaign really can be seen and heard? And uh, the way that I tried to do that, and I did do this uh, running for statewide office. Um, I traveled the state extensively. I really try to be on the ground as much as I can because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how much money you raise, you have to raise enough, but it's the vote, it's the vote. So what is it that's going to really be persuasive in terms of the person casting the vote, the communities casting the vote? And how are you gonna make that connection that I think only can be done in person about why you're the most compelling candidate? And so um, I think um, so. I think that while we have all these additional tools and support and training, uh, I think the, um, the things that have not changed is uh, just that in-person connection, which I think voters still crave. Well, I know, I mean, I, we were talking about just being excited about being in person again. So I know, I think all of us are, are just looking forward to being able to have those conversations yeah. in person. Um, I'm seeing another question here from an attendee um, asking how you help the governor to fix California from fiscal deficit to now having some surplus. And I think I'm also just hearing that collaborative moment with, with, you know, with the other offices too. And so, um, <laughs> yes, well, this pandemic has actually had each of us uh, really um, necessarily uh, staying in our own lane to some extent because we have so much that's been heightened in terms of our attention. I know for my team, uh, we've had lots of checks to cut and uh, we didn't miss a beat during this pandemic. Um, immediately, I uh, had three-fourths of my uh, of my team out of my 1,400 employees uh, 
uh, essentially pivot to telework and um, and the 25% uh, who stayed on site uh, had to do so for security reasons, but uh, we were still expected to issue tax refunds to pay state employees to you know, pay our vendors to get allocations uh, apportionments out to school districts and to local government so um, that didn't change but it was uh, made more complex by you know the work remote work environment for some of my my team members. Um, you know the other thing that. Um, and then, of course, uh, you know, you look at somebody like the superintendent of public instruction, you know, how you deal with, you know, um, just uh, distance learning, um, look at the treasurer in terms of just being sure that, you know, we are uh, making the right investments uh, without uh, a lot of uncertainty in those early days of the pandemic about what the market will look like. Um, so we all kind of really had to stay in our own lanes for uh, the most part, but then we came together because, um, you know, in terms of the messaging out about uh, COVID and the resources that were available, um, some of the public health uh, uh, and safety, health and safety guidelines, uh, we definitely were all coordinating around that. Uh, so unified message, uh, being sure that we were getting to some of our hard to reach communities, and uh, which I think has been great since, um, you know, among our statewide elected officials, we have, um, you know, um, uh, people representing the Latino community, certainly the Black community, the API community. And so we're definitely on the same page relative to that. And then definitely uh, with the uh, vaccines and, and uh, having the uh, vaccines available, uh, the messaging around that was also you know, very much unified and coordinated. So I would say with respect to COVID, uh, we definitely were uh, working together. I think with respect to our um, our, our unique uh, duties and responsibilities of the office. Uh, we just all were so saddled with additional responsibilities that um, I don't know that we, I think we just on the natural um, kind of collaborated when we knew we had to, but we pretty much just had to stay focused on doing the job that uh, we normally would do, but with a uh, heightened focus and urgency. Well, thank you for sharing that and just the importance of communication, but also I know for me, just hearing about the efforts around making sure the hard to reach communities were reached uh, yes. was really just so valuable to, to know that we had advocates for that too. So um, I'm gonna merge a few of these questions that came up because they're about that first time you decided to run for office. Um, what were some of the steps you took? Did you know yeah. what you were getting into? Um, or did you just learn on the job? Uh, how did that? How did that play out? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, I guess I would be considered a late bloomer uh, as an elected official. I um, really have been kind of a behind-the-scenes policy staff person, and mostly fiscal policy, to many, many elected officials. Um, and uh, when I, I, I was uh, former Governor Davis's state budget director uh, when he was uh, governor during his first four-year term, uh, before uh, the recall, and uh, decided that um, I wanted to help a colleague of mine um, establish her uh, administration as a newly elected member of the State Board of Equalization from San Francisco. And when I went over to become her chief deputy uh, in 2003, there was so much speculation that I was going to succeed her on the Board of Equalization. And I had no idea what people were talking about. I just wanted to you know, help her. Our tax policy was something I was interested in. And what uh, I had not known was that she was only gonna serve <clears throat> out half her term before running for a state Senate seat. And so um, there was uh, the speculation that I would succeed her. And I thought, well, that's crazy. I've never run for anything in my life. You know, I do much better behind the scenes. And then I looked at who was actually interested in, in uh, being nominated for the seat. And it was then Governor Schwarzenegger who had the ability to nominate a successor uh, to then State Board of Equalization uh, member Carol Migdon. Uh, but I, as her chief deputy, would uh, automatically uh, become the acting board member if the governor didn't make a nomination by uh, operation of law. So she left to assume a state Senate seat that she won in December, 2004. And I became the acting board member. Um, and I didn't even know then that I was gonna run for office. But uh, like I said, I saw who was interested and it was clearly people who uh, were legislators or people from the outside who were looking to come into politics. It was a stepping stone. Uh, they knew nothing about taxes that I know for sure because I could hear them make arguments about things that, that didn't make sense. And I decided, this is wrong. I have to like put my hat in the ring. And, um, and then I thought, okay, I've been working with so many elected officials. I'm not going to have any shortage of advice about how to run for office, but I really needed to uh, let my family know that, you know, being a candidate and being a, an elected official, I mean, your whole life is public. It's just public. So um, I went to my higher power, my mother, and uh, I said, mom, uh, I'm going to be running for office uh, for this uh, um, tax board. Um, the incumbent who just got elected to the Senate is supporting me. And uh, I think I can do this, but I just need to let you know that as a candidate, um, you know, our life is going to be very public, my background. Um, and uh, 
And she, I, I thought she was going to discourage me. If my dad were alive, he would have definitely discouraged me. And what my mom said was just so precious. Um, she's still alive. She's 98 years old today. Uh, I mean, still, still alive today at 98 years old. And she said to me, um, so what's the worst that they could say about you? That you grew up in a family uh, that was poor, raising six kids that all went to college and are now successful and you have a background in public finance. It's so fitting for this job. Like, go do it. Don't have regrets. And uh, and I was just like, whoa, <laughs> I, that was not what I expected. And I just felt like this was like the permission I needed. And uh, so, um, and I've just have always used that as my anchor. Um, and it was pretty much a message from my mother saying, um, have no regrets, you know, just go out there, do your best. And, um, you know, you feel like you're qualified and, and just, just go for it. So that was really um, a really big uh, moment for me. And then campaigning was, um, you know, was really about um, just looking back at all the relationships I established, you know, over 20 plus years of working with different people. And I was just really heartened at the support that I had uh, to run for the first time. And um, it was a seat that I won pretty handily uh, because of the background that I had. Uh, campaigning for the tax board was different than campaigning for controller uh, later on because it's essentially a seat that you win by uh, mail and endorsements and uh, raising enough money to you know do your mail. It's not a field campaign by any means, um, representing 9 million Californians. Uh, but then running for controller, it was a much different story. It was a combination of both, um, you know, really being in strategic places at different times and, and also running. So when I ran for statewide office, um, I went back to my mother to tell her I was going to run for statewide office. And um, she kind of first said, why do you want to do that? Because it was a much bigger stage. But then she also recognized that I have the passion to do it. And I continued to have her support. So, I mean... I think it's also fun that the thing your mom said about like, what's the worst they could say is basically the story you started off with, right. you know, and, and just kind of owning it and it's, you know, and, and the narrative that it is. So I thought that's pretty, um, just being aware of it and also how people might use it, but that it's yeah. not, not something negative, right? And no, so not at all. And, and, and as you're speaking, Nancy, it, it brings to my mind that I think one of the things that we often take for granted is that ownership of our narrative. Um, and the big and one big lesson in politics, I will say to anybody who's interested in running or, or elevating leadership is uh, we have to own that narrative and we have to define ourselves before others define us. And uh, because it, when you're in public life, um, people are always out to define who you are. They will take any position you uh, may have on an issue and twist it to their convenience. But if you're out there ahead of it and owning it and can explain kind of where you are on things, um, it's so much better. And it's actually the kind of leadership that I think people really want. No, and I think, and, and now that we're talking about controlling narrative, I'm seeing that there's a question uh, from an alum, Alan Au. And he's asking, actually, as an elected official, you're basically operating in a space where it is not possible to appease or satisfy everyone. Uh, with that in mind, what is a decision you've made that was basically a damned if you do or damned if you don't? And how do you na navigate that kind of decision making? Yeah, um, I've had lots of those decisions. Um, I would say I've had a few. Um, I'll, I'll give you one that's a concrete example. Um, I serve on the State Lands Commission, which has jurisdiction over all of our California public lands, um, our desert lands, our tide lands that are managed by our ports in California. And um, you know, we had a, um, a permit come to us, um, and some of you may know this project, but it was the uh, water desalination plant in Huntington Beach. And um, I was actually against the project because this was a desalination plant that was going to produce water for which there was no current demand which means that once the water is produced, someone is having to pay for that water and it's really expensive water to produce. Um, not to mention that um, desalination plants actually um, emit a lot of greenhouse gases. And so uh, it was not gonna be necessarily the best for our environment as well. Um, politically, uh, I knew that the votes likely would be there because there was a lot of support for the project, uh, but I just felt like it was really the wrong time and uh, somebody was gonna be saddled with the bill for this. and. And so um, I conditioned the heck out of the permit, um, just to say it's got to, the operations have to be um, greenhouse gas emissions neutral, uh, that um, there has to be um, uh, a needs assessment on the water um, before uh, the project gets uh, approved by all of the state regulatory agencies. And we were just the first agency to take a look at the project. And then uh, being sure that uh, the, the jobs that were gonna be um, 
uh, created uh, for that project were going to be um, permanent, you know, uh, good quality jobs and, and union jobs. Uh, so the, con the permit was uh, conditioned. And what I would say about, you know, just kind of these decisions that are controversial, um, my way of dealing with it is just to be straight up. Um, you know, to put things on the record as to why I vote the way that I do. You're not going to be able to please everyone. You're absolutely right. Um, but you come into these situations with a set of values about what's important to you. And hopefully your decisions will reflect what your values are and that you have an opportunity to express what's important uh, when you look at uh, these types of projects that, you know, I mean, look, we're going to need water desalination in the future, just not now, uh, because somebody's going to have to pay for it until the water is actually in need. Um, and we are in a drought, so maybe this is a, a good time. But, uh, but I think being forthright, being honest, uh, not trying to please everyone, because I think that's a trap. Once you try to please everyone, you end up really pleasing no one. Um, and more importantly, what progress have you actually made uh, in terms of you know, just trying to you know, get to an outcome that's going to be helpful to, to communities? And so um, I have found that to work time and time again for me throughout my career. And I think it's something that uh, people do appreciate that you just are honest and forthright about where you stand. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I was going to ask you one more question before I have everyone turn on their cameras for a photo with you. That's my warning for everyone to prep. Um, but yeah, what is your hope for elected leaders in the future and API elected leaders in the future? Yeah, uh, thank you for that. Um, my hope, I hope there are more of us um, at all levels of government. Uh, and I think we're seeing that. I really am pleased to see the interest of so many um, throughout California at different levels running for different offices. And I've had the opportunity to support many in local government who are running um, and mentor um, uh, quite a few as well. Uh, so I would say definitely much many more of us. Um, but I think given the times that we're in, um, I also have some other hopes. And that is, um, you know, I look at this time that um, our community is facing right now. And um, I think as leaders, we're often uh, confronted with um, just things where, you know, we don't have necessarily a, a guidebook or a handbook or a manual that tells us, you know, how to lead during these times that are um, so uncertain, that are so uh, anxiety driven for people um, that they look to their leaders for some comfort. And so I would say, um, you know, leadership with empathy. Uh, I would say leadership that really recognizes that we have to try to do our best to bring people together within our own community um, so that we can have conversations that are tough to have. Um, I think the, the API diaspora is so diverse that uh, if we as leaders can help just bridge the understanding among all of us within you know, our diverse communities, that is uh, really a great step. But I think more importantly, how do we as uh, the API diaspora uh, recognize, uh, you know, the allies that we have uh, outside of our own community, and how do we create those safe spaces to have those conversations and those relationships, and that really, I hope, um, you know, give us a chance to really uh, heal and have that reckoning with uh, you know, just all of the, uh, you know, the, the, the racial injustice that so many of our communities have experienced, and so that's my hope. And uh, I think it's uh, something that we're all gonna have to work on together. And I am seeing some really good signs about you know, just uh, how that can happen. And, um, and the first of which is we just have to be visible. We're not you know, locking ourselves up behind closed doors, staying at home, but that we are out on the streets, we are speaking out, we are just you know, calling out injustice every time we see it. And I think uh, the, our, our leadership, and I include myself in that, um, should never miss the opportunity to, to model what that looks like. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here today and for Thank sharing you, your story, your insights with us. <laughs> Thank you, Nancy. Always I'm a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Controller Yu, for your time. Thanks, everyone. Um, Thanks, Nancy. Sure. Um, I'm now going to hand it over to our next, um, uh, to Robert Yap, who's going to introduce uh, Attorney General Bonta. Um, he's a cause board member, and he's also the CEO and co-founder of Gen Mobile. Uh, admittedly, he's also my brother. Um, I feel like at some point, we just can't hide that either. So uh, I'm going to hand it over to him, and he'll take it away from here. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, on behalf of the board of cause, we want to congratulate uh, Rob for his appointment to be the first Filipino-American California Attorney General. Born in the Philippines, he came to the US as a young boy in his early childhood in La Paz, California, where the United Farm Workers was headquartered. 
He watched his parents organize Filipino American and Mexican American farm workers. And in his words, experienced firsthand one of the greatest peaceful, social, racial, and economic justice, justice movements. He has brought those lessons and values with him throughout his career, including at the city attorney's office of San Francisco, as a state assemblyman, and now as our attorney general. He is the coalition builder who fights for our community and for all communities. He has fought for the history of Filipino Americans in the labor movement to be taught in our schools in California. And he has authored a law requiring independent review of officer involved shootings. Throughout his career, he has fought for justice for on racial, economic, and environmental issues. And of course, he's extremely qualified as our attorney general. He graduated from uh, Yale Law School. Um, and as we talk about clear, you know, clearing uh, a pathway and, and making your path to elected office, you should definitely pay attention to how um, uh, attorney general Rob uh, Bonta has done this because he's won every election with 85% of the vote. That's both primary and in the general election. Um, I'm also excited to say that I was an early supporter because he was a fellow Rob, uh, a fellow Filipino American, and, and really ju has just been an amazing advocate for us and our community. Thank you, Attorney General Rob Bonta for joining us today. Thank you, Rob, for the very kind introduction. It's good to be a Rob, a fellow Rob uh, with you and uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here with Kaz and uh, look forward to our conversation. Thank you for the very generous introduction. You're welcome. And, and um, let's kick it off with, um, you know, this, this group is particularly interested in getting more civically engaged and in general, um, uh, thinking about how uh, to get more involved. Um, the group is very interested in knowing, you know, how you were inspired to run for office and, and what was that moment that you decided to actually jump in and run? You know, I, I, I hand wrung about it for a long time. I, for some people, they have a great story about that aha moment when they were cruising through life with no thought of ever running for office. And then all of a sudden they said, you know, I have to do this. I have to uh, step out there and, and uh, put myself out there and run for office. That, you know, that, that wasn't me. I, I grew up with parents who were social justice activists to their core. They're, you know, fierce forces for fairness and, you know, have been part of some of the greatest social justice movements in the history of our of our uh, state and, and of our nation. My dad marched in Selma. He organized for voting rights and civil rights. He was in church when Martin Luther King Jr. spoke. He met Stokely Carmichael. He felt called to be out there after listening to audio cassette tapes sent to him by one of his colleagues from across the country and took a train for three days to be on the ground fighting uh, for a, a better nation and a, a more equal society. And both my parents worked for the United Farm Workers of America. Um, we lived in a trailer, stone's throw away from the home of Cesar Chavez. We hosted Philip Veracruz, the great Filipino American uh, farm worker leader in our home for, um, for Filipino breakfast when he would come visit. And then my mom fought for the restoration of democracy in the Philippines for many years. And I grew up going to demonstrations and rallies and protests, uh, small uh, uh, organic grassroots fundraisers, uh, collecting coins from Christmas caroling to raise money for uh, the, the effort. And that's the household I grew up in. Uh, those are the stories that were told with me. Those are the uh, events and people that I grew up around at, at a young age. And so it was always sort of uh, in my DNA and in my blood to serve, uh, whether I knew it or not. And I didn't know it at, at a young age. You know, I, I wanted to be a, a, a kid. Um, but as I grew up, th that legacy uh, was something that became more and more important to me. And I wanted to take the baton from my parents and carry on the work and, and, and serve. And um, I was able to go to, through some, actually some training sessions that sort of were scared straight, uh, programs that that showed you warts and all challenges and all what it's like to run for office and uh, there was someone named Ron Wong who many of you know uh, in Los Angeles who looked at me and he said you're going to be the first Filipino American state legislator in the history of California it was before I ever ran for anything uh, he he believed in me before I believed in myself and he continued to, to push me and lift me up and uh, mentor me and support me along the way and um, I dipped my toe in the water. I, I, I was on volunteer commissions and you know, appointed in, in the city that I lived in, the city of Alameda. Then I got appointed to the Alameda Healthcare District Board, a special district. And I really highly recommend the, the appointed route if you can get it. Um, 
And then I got elected in a, comp a competitive election for a city council. And when I ran for assembly, I ran because I thought the state was underfunding our schools. I had children in, in public schools. I had been part of a statewide lawsuit that sued the state of California for not meeting its constitutional uh, duties and obligations to fully fund our schools and provide a quality education. And I also felt that uh, ending redevelopment agencies, which were ways to create more affordable housing and um, uh, more economic development was was a problem. So I, I wanted to be uh, uh, what I what we didn't see a lot of in in Sacramento: a, a young parent with in a working family uh, fighting for a better future for our, our kids and our family. And and um, but I always knew I was going to be in public service. I never knew necessarily I was going to be in elected office, but I always felt that um, serving others, uh, lifting people up, making lives better, trying to create a fair, more just society was. Uh, what drove me and um, what made me tick and was the mission I wanted to be a part of. I know, I know you mentioned that one of your one of your mentors was Ron Wong. Um, who, who else do you feel um, helped pave the way for you uh, to become an elected official? Who, who uh, you know, uh, when we when we were uh, coming out of law school, we were about the same year. Um, there weren't a whole lot of Asian American elected officials. Um, just the notion to say, hey, maybe Maybe I should go for this. It's something that I want to do uh, as part of my mission, as part of the, the way I want to serve. Um, who are those folks who, who helped you find that path and who inspired you to that path? Uh, APIs or, or just generally to, to, to public, you mean for, to inspire me to go to public service? Uh, both, I, I think. Maybe you early know, on was hard on the API front because there weren't too many elected. <laughs> That's yeah, cool. you know there, there were um, you know, f folks like my mom, just a, a, a you know a social justice a a activist and advocate who was part of a lot of elections and and like really fought for people she believed in and wanted them to be in office because she knew that uh, activism uh, would be uh, that her work would be amplified and magnified if she had partners with positional power who could make decisions that could help the communities that she was fighting for. So. Um, uh, you know, she inspired me and, uh, to want to run because she was supporting others, and I know that she always believed in me and 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 had high hopes for me. Uh, people like Ron Wong, who had been through this, you know, very experienced in politics and policy and in, in government in California, who had seen a lot and and saw something in me, uh, made me um, believe that it might it might be possible. And then, you know, there's folks uh, when I ran for the first time, like like Fiona Ma, who was in the assembly and uh, was just so supportive and so loyal and uh, such a strong partner and friend and opened up, kicked down doors for me and brought me through and, and uh, introduced me to her network. You know, you need folks who can, who can uh, be by your side and pick you up and um, show you the way and open up doors. And I had that in, in, in a handful of people, but I was also fighting the, the perception that, you know, Filipino Americans can't be in, in, in the assembly because uh, they never have before. It had been almost 160 years and, they, and, and they've never made it. And so, uh, you know, they're either not qualified or their community is not supportive enough, or, you know, there's some barrier, some bamboo ceiling that they just can't break through. Um, and I was intent on, on, on changing that narrative. Sometimes you don't believe it's possible until you see it happening, um, until you see someone there and, you know, representation matters and having uh, people in that seat, uh, you know, I, I know would, would change that belief that it can't happen because uh, we will have made it happen. And I wanted to inspire others to uh, step up into their power and, and into positions and, uh, that we deserve to have our seat at the table. So um, there, there were a, a few folks, Warren Furtani was another, he, he, he was the API caucus chair when I ran and I met with them and he, he, he on the spot said, you know, it, your, your story is, is righteous, your, your cause uh, is for justice and I support you. I don't need to know anything else. You know, he didn't put his finger in the air and, and think about the politics and who might get mad and who else was running. Uh, he, he just believed in, um, uh, you know, from his heart and based on his values that it was the right thing to do to support me. And so that helped me get some momentum. And, you know, once a, a couple of people are supporting you and believe in you, then, um, you know, you, 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 you feel that you need to do everything in your own power to make sure that you're not uh, going to disappoint those who got behind you. Um, and, you know, my mom, uh, when I ran for city council, um, she had been a lawful permanent resident for decades, uh, came to the Philippines on a, a three week, three week ship ride when she was 28 years old. And I remember when I was running my campaign, um, and, and sitting at a computer, she lived next door to me in a, um, 
uh, in, in a cottage that was part of our, our, um, our property. And she walked in and she said, uh, babe, I think I'm gonna become a citizen so I can vote for you. And I was like, oh my God, I need to do everything in my power to win this race. <laughs> now that mom became a citizen so she could vote for me. Uh, so it was, a, it was a good inspiration. Um, uh, you know, I always said, I'm, you know, I, I can't, at the end of every night, I've been, I've been as, you know, seven events, there was an eighth and a ninth to go to. And I would ask myself, am I going to go home or am I going to go to these events? And I thought about my mom and I always went to the events and, and always did that extra to make sure I left no stone unturned and um, it was never going to be outworked. I might lose, the voters might not want me, but it wouldn't be because I got outworked. And I was inspired by my mother to do everything in my power to make the best case I could to the voters. You know, I think that's um, um, something, you bring up something that I think is a real issue, a real fact of, of running for office. And I think as uh, we talk to this group about what it means to become an elected official, um, uh, just the stamina for, for eight events, um, you know, how, how did you first get into that? Like, and, and maybe you could describe a little bit of what are, what are those, what, what would ever bring you to eight events in one evening? Um, <laughs> um, I mean, yeah. it's, um, it's definitely a grind and, and um, campaigning and being a candidate is not, to me, not, not rocket science. Uh, uh, it, it, you know, obviously there's important strategy involved and, um, but a, a lot of it is just old fashioned, roll up your sleeves, hard work, elbow grease, uh, getting out there, having the, the, you know, the, the, the famed and sought after fire in the belly to keep grinding and pushing and, um, and do what's necessary. You know, every, and every elected official who's making a decision about an endorsement always looks for that in the candidates. They want to see someone who's getting after it, who's, who's doing the hard work, who's reaching out to the right people, who's present at the right events, who's visible. Um, and, um, I knew that's what I had to do. And, and I'm, you know, I'm competitive by nature. I grew up playing uh, competitive soccer. Um, you know, my, my parents were dealing with a kid who had, uh, who was hyperactive and had a lot of energy. And one day when I was seven years old in the Sacramento summer heat, they put me on a soccer field and I ran around and I had fun and wanted to come back the next day. But most importantly, I went to sleep that night uh, without bothering them. And so they brought me back again. And that led to a, a very competitive career in soccer, uh, uh, being a national college soccer recruit, traveling around the world as part of select teams, including the under 20 national team. And so that, that spirit of being part of a team, of having a common goal of, of fighting for each other and with one another, uh, and you know, being competitive uh, to, to fight hard and fight fair uh, for a common goal and to uh, be victorious together you know, with a mission, um, and uh, as part of a movement was something uh, that drove me as well. So um, yeah, I've always been blessed with a, with a motor, um, an internal motor that allows me to, to grind and drive. I don't necessarily have a lot of talent or brains, but I work hard and, I, and I'm relentless. And um, that's an important part of being uh, a successful campaigner. I think you yeah, both for sure. So, <laughs> um, I wanna open up to the uh, CLI fellows um, and the others on the call. Um, feel free to raise your hand if you want to uh, ask a question, or you can also put it here in the chat. Um, while we're waiting for questions to come through, um, oh, I have one here from Eileen Flores. Eileen, do you want to open your camera and ask your question? So, magandang gabi. Um, I want to thank you for joining our class tonight. Um, I um, well, also wanted to share that I grew up in Alameda and in the Bay Area, and now I live in Southern California. And I wanted to get your thoughts on, um, you know, some of the challenges and advantages that you see for the November um, 22 election um, as an appointee, especially, you know, you're more known in Northern California um, versus Southern California. So wanted to get your thoughts on that. Well, I appreciate it. Nice to see you. And thanks for the kind words. And I, you know, it, it, it being an appointee is, is certainly um, uh, an advantage, you know, being in the role and being able to demonstrate that you can do the role if that's what I'm able to demonstrate. And that's what the people of California uh, believe is, is really important. You know, I, I'll have a record uh, to, to run on. And I always think the best way to, um, to win election is to do great in the job that you're in. And usually you're in another job asking to be elected to um, uh, you know, a new role. Uh, uh, although, you know, as 
uh, I, I ran 10 times for the assembly for, for re-election. And so each time it was my, it was my job review where the, you know, 500,000 constituents of my district were the ones conducting that review and saying, uh, telling me whether they wanted me to stay or they wanted a, a new course or a new direction. So I had that opportunity here to, to, um, to have a record and to have a record of action and uh, driven by values uh, to make a difference in the lives of Californians. So I think that's that's important, and I'm honored and privileged for that uh, appointment. And it's not a long time, though. It's, you know, the, the election, the June primary, if it is a June primary next year, uh, as scheduled, is less than a year away. Um, I am more known in the Bay Area, um, and I've also... Uh, spent, uh, you know, my last almost 10 years in the California State Assembly believing that my role is to do two things, fight for my constituents, but also fight for all Californians and to make California a better place. So um, I will need to to be to get more exposure and and be introduced um, and get more well known in, in areas like LA and, and San Diego. I have a foothold in, in some regards, but I, I need to build that up. And then it's just a bigger race. It's um, it's 80 times bigger than the race that I've run. There's 80 assembly members. I, my district was about half a million people. Now I'm running in a state that's 40 million people. And so there's just a lot more ground to cover, a lot more uh, money to raise, to communicate statewide, to penetrate, and, and to be able to, to, to communicate to voters about my values and my record and what I stand for. So uh, it's no small feat, um, uh, but I'm, I'm well aware of what it takes. You know, we have a, a full campaign plan already prepared with, uh, you know, a, a funding plan and um, a plan for how to communicate and how to reach out to voters and um, and how to win, uh, both in the primary and in the general. So I, I've been honored to be able to uh, have won every race I've ever been in, um, even when there's been multiple candidates, I've always come in first. Uh, I don't take that for granted. I know it's, that has to be earned every time. And uh, I'm, I'm going to fight my hardest to, to not break that streak. Um, Attorney, Attorney General Bonta, you know, I think um, we talked about your election. I, I mentioned your election record, 85%. I looked up your district your, that you were state assembly in, and it is uh, the most um, evenly broke up by race that I think is around. 25% white, 25% black, 25% Latino, and 25% Asian. How did, how, as you as you made your path in that district, how did you bring together um, 85 percent of that vote? Like, what what was it that helped you cross those boundaries? I think coalition building is absolutely critical. Um, collaboration, allyship, partnership, uh, identity politics is really an important part of um, politics, but it, it it's more than that too. Um, you, you candidates win. Uh, tough races and, and tight races with coalitions. And so, um, you know, the, I wasn't going to win with just a Filipino American vote or, or the API vote. Uh, Filipino Americans were our single digits in, in my district. And uh, as you mentioned, API uh, community is uh, about a quarter. So it was really important to be able to appeal to and communicate to and show uh, alignment and shared values and uh, shared commitment to a common future with all the communities in the district. And I did my best to do that. I think, for example, my my roots with United Farm Workers uh, really resonated with a lot of Latino voters. Um, my family's roots with the civil rights movement uh, really resonated with a lot of African American voters. Um, and uh, it, you know, my my approach, which I which I hope and intend to be one that is uh, open minded and, and thoughtful and uh, full of listening uh, before um, making a decision, which helps as many people as possible. I, I think resonated with. With a, with a, with a, a lot of folks, and then and the values of the district. While while there's diversity in ethnicity, um, the the values are very progressive, social justice oriented, um, and and sort of pushing on the on the progressive cutting edge. The, the, this district has been identified as the bluest of the blue districts in the whole state. Um, Congress member Barbara Lee is our Congress member and sort of, you know, that spirit and carrying on that legacy, fighting for the underserved, the vulnerable, the voiceless. Uh, being a champion for equity and social justice and opportunity has has always been a part of um, the candidates, successful candidates who who come to represent this seat. So, um, but I was very cognizant of, of the need to, and the, um, it, it was part of my my spirit to create those collaborations and appeal to as many different communities as possible. And, and one of them, you know, part of that came from my own story. You know, there there would be no farm worker movement. Uh, without Cesar and, and no farmer worker movement without Larry, you know, Larry Itliong and Cesar Chavez, you know, Filipinos fighting side by side with Latinos, two great leaders, instead of being pitted against one another, joining forces with one another 
and uh, you know, creating a change, which um, you know is now history, is something that's always inspired me. And so, seeking to replicate that um, through collaboration among different groups uh, has always been important to me. Uh, thank you, Rob, for your answer. I, I have one question here from the chat. Uh, what are the toughest issues facing California now, and what can we do as the AAPI community to help? There's so many uh, tough issues. You know, we, uh, the last year we spent really fighting an international pandemic that caused a, an economic recession uh, that revealed uh, the inequities of our, of our society and exacerbated them. We were, all, we were in a racial justice reckoning, um, you know, in the middle of the Black Lives Matter movement and, and fighting for sustainable, durable change after the murder of George Floyd. Uh, we're in the, still in the middle of a climate crisis, a housing and, and uh, homelessness crisis. Wildfires, wildfires, are, wildfires are still um, on the horizon. So uh, there are many, and none of them are simple. And um, we're emerging from the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we got a lot of vaccines in arms, and we're, we're now reopened as of yesterday uh, uh, in, in most respects. And so we're, you know, I have hope and optimism that we're moving in the right direction, but, you know, climate, the climate crisis is an existential threat. California must lead in that space. If California doesn't, you know, the, the, the world is at risk. It's, it, it's always been our role to be on the cutting edge and, and, and the vanguard when it comes to that. We, we just need to be a more affordable state. It, 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 it's not working for a lot of people. The income inequality gap is too much. Housing is too unaffordable. Um, there's not enough housing. Uh, we need to support our, our, our tenants. Um, we the API uh, anti API hate violence is is a state of crisis right now, a state of emergency. Um, er, you know, folks like my mom are afraid to do everyday things. Uh, she was afraid to go, you know take a, a lift in, in, from Alameda to San Francisco, uh, and she asked me if she, I thought it was okay because uh, she was worried about the anti API hate violence, and I said I don't think it's okay. Uh, I'll take you, or or uh, my sister, uh, or my or my brother, uh, or you know someone who will, can take care of you and look after you will take you instead, and that's uh, not uncommon at all right now. A lot of folks are living in fear and are anxious, and I think it's important for the API community certainly to to lean in uh, to this moment, um, uh, to stand tall as we have been uh, in calling out and condemning uh, API hate violence, and also. Um, taking action, but but to be part of the solutions for every one of these difficult issues. That's, you know, to me, that that's what our legacy is. That's who we are. We're, we're change makers, we're leaders. Um, we bend the arc towards uh, more justice and fairness. We solve problems. And, um, you know, that, that's not always what the stereotype is uh, of an Asian American, but that's what history has shown we are. And so um, taking our rightful seats at tables of influence and power, and being change makers that are driving us towards the future that we deserve and that we aspire to have, I think is, is what we can and should do as an API community. And, but, and, but you know, coming together uh, in, in this critical moment, critical moment is very important. We're diverse uh, as an API community, uh, you know, coming from with origins in different countries, different cultures, different languages, different histories, um, but with a shared experience here in many ways, one defined by um, you know, on the one hand, um, feeling the sting of hate uh, too often in too many ways, uh, having barriers um, and, and, and to opportunity, uh, but also in shaping and building this state and this nation and creating a better California and a better America. So um, I think we step up and lean in and, and uh, help change some of the most vexing problems that we're facing in California. Thank you, Rob, for the answer. I mean, I think um, your story is a big part of the story that really needs to be told and your families and a lot of those who protested and fought for all different types of issues um, and for the, and across allyship and across um, um, issues. Um, I do have a wrap up question here from um, uh, one, one of our um, attendees um, asking, what advice do you give uh, to young APIs who want to follow in your footsteps become an elected. <laughs> you know, uh, my, my view and my, my advice and recommendation, if you can do it, is to do what you love. I, I know that that can be a luxury and a, and, and a privilege. Not everyone can do what they love. Um, I'm doing what I love. So I'm, I'm honored and thankful and appreciative of that opportunity. 
Um, I want to make people's lives better. I, I want to serve. I want to help address some of the biggest problems we're facing and 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 resolve them or 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 fix them. I want to help relieve pain and and uplift people. And um, the role that I'm in allows for that. So I, I I'm very excited for that. And I think people do best at what they love doing, and what they feel. Um, fulfilled in, in doing. And that could be different things for different people. So um, and part of that is, is being your authentic you. Um, you know, I, I know a lot of us have expectations from family uh, and loved ones and parents. Those expectations might not be aligned with what we want to do. Uh, I, I want to encourage folks to, to do what you want to do. Um, you know, of course, we have to manage our families and uh, our loved ones. But, um, you know, we, we, have, we have one life and we want to make it count. And um, to the extent you have that uh, luxury and privilege, um, then, you know, do what you love, uh, be your authentic self, you know, bring, bring your stories and your life experiences to the work. Um, uh, you know, what we do is, 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 and can be, and should be, you know, emotional. We're emotionally invested because we care, um, and, you know, lead with, with kindness and compassion and empathy. I think that will make us stronger as a society and, you know, as a state nation and world, um, and, you know, take, take some chances, Take some risks. You know, not everything is, is comfortable and easy. Uh, often, the, the the harder route is is the uh, the more rewarding route, the more righteous route. Um, you know, I often think about the um, the Delano Manongs in uh, in 1965 when they went to the Filipino Community Hall and Larry Itliang assembled them and basically, you know, uh, called the question and said, "Are we going to go on strike and put it all on the line?" and risk our livelihood and our jobs and our, our security and, and put at risk the money that we are sending home to our families. Um, and uh, or are we gonna continue to work under these conditions that we know are unfair, that we know are unjust? And you know they were unanimous in their vote to uh, take the risky route um, uh, because it was the righteous route. And, and in the end they prevailed and you know, they, they changed the state and, and they changed this nation. So, um, uh, I encourage you to do 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 what you love if you can. Uh, be your authentic selves. Bring your 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 life experiences and your stories. Don't be ashamed of them. Uh, tell them and be proud of them and loud with them. And um, and if you do want to serve in, in in public service, there are some realities to to running. I always encourage candidates to uh, you know race selection, um, meaning that the race that you decide to get in, involved in is very important. Don't you know, don't have your first race be running for US president, probably, uh, you know, pick something that um, is something you care about, um, that you have a, a, a pathway to victory for that, you know, you're going to be up for and you're going to do everything that's, that's necessary. When someone says, I'm just running to have my name on the ballot, um, then I, I know they're not serious. Uh, when you run, run to win and, and, and run to win so that you can serve and make it count once you get there to help people. Um, so those are some of my thoughts. And, uh, but I also say this for, for, for young folks in the next generation, I am very inspired and very uh, comfortable uh, uh, and, and excited for what you bring to the table. Because what I've seen in the next generation is a moral clarity that I haven't seen before. Um, you know, there is no doubt um, and there's a moral certainty about the wrongness of the murder of George Floyd, of structural and systemic racism, of the need for uh, police accountability and uh, building of trust between community and law enforcement, of the need to be more urgent about um, addressing the climate crisis, of the need to be more um, focused and committed to addressing gun violence. I see that in the next generation and it makes me proud, thankful, and know that we're in good hands. So um, finally, I'll say a, a lot of people tell young folks, um, you're the leaders of tomorrow. Um, I tell you that you're the leaders of today. And and now is your time. You can step up now and make a change and make a difference. Uh, own your power. Don't let anyone tell you you have to wait. Um, your time isn't tomorrow. Your time is now. Thank you, Attorney General Rob Bonta, for those words and, and for the discussion today. Um, I do want to hand it back to um, CAUSE's Executive Director, uh, Nancy Epp, for any final closing comments. First, I just want to thank Attorney General Bonta for being here. We'd love a photo with you. Thanks Everyone ready? <laughs> and let me give a shout out to Ayana Galas, who I know is with you. I, I, I'm sure I just embarrassed her, but what's up, Ayana? I miss you. How are you? Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, Ayana. <laughs> <laughs>
And we'll make sure that you're next to Ayana in the photo that we released. <laughs> <laughs> we can do those kinds of Zoom tricks here. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Nancy. Thanks, Kaz. Good luck to everybody. Thank you. Good see you. See you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. All right, everyone, we're coming to the close of our program. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here today. Uh, we just had a couple of thank yous. Um, I know you've heard us say thank you to Controller Yi and Attorney General Bonta um, for their time today. Also, thank you to Charlie Wu, Robert Yap, and all the other cause board members who were supportive today and here, um, both for being at this event as well as supporting our Cause Leadership Institute. Thank you to all the fellows um, for, as always, just being super present and just really, um, you know, asking good questions. Uh, I know for me, it was really a meaningful uh, conversation for both, both of the elected officials. So thank you for that. Um, also, just want to do a shout out to the cause team. Uh, there was a lot of kind of behind the scenes moving pieces, even for this virtual Zoom. Um, so I wanted to take this time to thank Steve Lynn, Justine Ventura Mejia, Sarah Sue and Palia Campo. So thanks to the cause team. Thank you for being here. Also, we want to make sure that you all save the date. We're going to have another one of these up close and personal with a focus on women in power on August 11th, uh, and which is going to be held at the same time from 7 to 8.30. So mark your calendars. Uh, so thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you for joining us tonight. And we hope that you enjoyed the conversation. We did record it, and so we're also going to share that with all of you in case you missed parts or wanted to hear parts again, um, and then we'll post them online. Uh, it was great seeing everybody. Thanks so much for tonight.